<laughs> I'm curious, how many of you are today rooting for the Patriots? You. How many want the Rams to win? How many of you are cheering for the commercials? <laughs> I, I love seeing the puppy and the horse make friends. That's always the best. Uh, the last Super Bowl I really cared about, that I was totally invested in, was when the Chicago Bears beat the Patriots in 1986. You see, I watched living outside Chicago nearly the entire 85-86 season with my daddy. It was a bonding time. I had a big crush on Jim McMahon. And I knew the Super Bowl shuffle by heart. Since then, I really like watching the commercials. <laughs> it's interesting though, isn't it? When you get fans of rival teams in the same room together, sometimes they can laugh about it and understand one another's passion. <laughs> Sometimes the tension and disdain is palpable, which is disappointing because after all, today is the National Day of Prayer. Okay, not officially, but we know there will be lots of people praying today for their team to win, right? <laughs> it, it happens every year. Last year, there were all these theories about how Jesus was somehow interfering on the Patriots' behalf, and they kept winning all the coin tosses. And there were those who were certain that God was on the Patriots' side because apparently there were many Christians on the Patriots' team. But last year, we know, they lost anyway. And I've seen articles this year about why God should be on the Rams' side. But I've heard that in God's eyes, both the Patriots and the Rams, they're all saints to God. You catch that one? <laughs> Um, but, yeah, it's a dad joke. <laughs> so, I think, though, it is normal and natural that we want to believe that God is rooting for the same team as us, right? God should be backing our players. God should be on our side. And I think... That's sort of where the Nazarenes were in Luke's gospel that we just heard. See, Jesus was their hometown boy turned minor celebrity. There had been talk about how he had been going around performing miracles and healing people. And now he was back, and so they were expecting to reap the benefits of having him around. And so when Jesus came to the synagogue that day, they were excited. He was there. And they were happy to have him come up and read scripture. And even after he sat down after reading just one verse, they were still intrigued. And when Jesus announced that he had been anointed to bring good news to the poor, to release to the captives, restore sight to the blind, free the oppressed, and announce the year of God's favor. They were all for it. There were poor in their midst who could definitely use some good news. And who among them didn't want a dose of God's favor? 
But the Nazarenes, it seems, didn't get it. They weren't understanding exactly who Jesus was speaking about. And so Jesus took a step back and explained a little bit more clearly that he wasn't there to bring blessing to them. Jesus had arrived to bring blessing to those who they couldn't stand. Bring blessing to the other team. Jesus reminded those in the synagogue that day stories from their scripture that they would have rather forgotten about how Elijah could have helped so many starving widows in Israel, but instead, God sent him to a widowed woman in Sidon. Eh. Why do you have to go there? And Jesus reminded them the story of Elisha. And how in Israel there were plenty of lepers who could have used healing. But instead... Elisha went and healed a Syrian. What the Nazarenes objected to was that Elijah and Elisha seemed to ignore that unwritten rule that I think we all know that we're supposed to fix things at home before going and helping outsiders. Elijah and Elisha weren't even just helping outsiders. They were bringing healing and wholeness to those who could be considered enemies. To those who did not know God by the same name, those who did not worship the same, those who didn't look like them or speak the same language or dress the same, those who did not follow the law, those who didn't share their traditions or their values. This was unacceptable. And when the Nazarenes put it together, what Jesus was saying, they couldn't accept him. When when they realized he wasn't going to set up base in his hometown among those who he had grown up with and share all of his blessings with them, they were infuriated. Because it was like Jesus was suddenly rooting for the other team. <coughs> like he was a traitor. And just who did he think he was talking about blessing outsiders? That the Lord's favor should be for them. If they couldn't get Jesus to do their bidding, no one else was going to. And so with hate and jealousy in their hearts, these people who had known Jesus since he was a child, literally tried to drive him off a cliff. I think the Nazarenes had a very human reaction. From the time of picking teams on the playground at recess, we all want to be on the right side. You can call it school spirit, you can call it pride in your community, in your heritage, patriotism, so many ways where we divide ourselves and we want to be winners. And I don't think there's anything wrong with wanting to be a winner. But so often we 
we take that a step further, where we start looking down our noses at the other team and believing ourselves to be more righteous and superior than they are. The thing is, it's been said, whenever we draw a line to decide who's in and who's out in order to exclude others, Jesus goes to the other side of the line every time and then invites us in. We heard in our Old Testament lesson from Jeremiah about how God spoke with Jeremiah about how before Jeremiah was even born, he was known and loved and chosen. I think we all have an instinct to want to identify with Jeremiah and believe that verse is about us. We're on the inside. But in Luke's Gospel, Jesus shares with us that God also makes others precious and holy. That God also knows and loves and chooses those who might make us shudder or tense up or be uncomfortable or feel unsafe because we believe them to be unworthy or insignificant or unnatural or just not like us. Through Elijah, through Elisha, through Jesus, we learn that God also knows and loves and chooses those who know God by a different name, those who worship differently, those who don't play the same game with the same rules. Jesus is telling his hometown, and he tells us that he doesn't play favorites and bless us more just because we are Christians. And when we draw that line to separate ourselves from others, he crosses over and invites us to come and learn what love is. We heard in the second lesson Paul's letter to the Corinthians telling us about love. That love is patient and kind and understanding, not arrogant or rude, insisting on its own way or that we are superior. And like it or not, even if it doesn't sit with us well, even if it makes us angry the way the Nazarenes were angry, Jesus comes and invites us, no, demands us to love those on the other side of the field, to be patient and kind and understanding and welcoming and intentionally inclusive of those who don't wear our team colors. To proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ in word, but maybe more so in action. To care for others near and far. And the world God has made and loves. To work for justice and peace to those who are on and off the field, on any team, because they are.
are all saints in God's eyes. And God is cheering for them. And God is cheering for us. And God is cheering for us to cheer for them. Because that's what it looks like on God's team. Amen. Amen.